Good afternoon. We've got some folks joining us. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Leave No Trace Awareness training this afternoon with Community Nature Connection. Thanks so much for being here. We're gonna get started in another minute um, as we give folks a little bit of time to join. So thanks so much everybody for being here this afternoon. We'll be getting started shortly. I'm going to go ahead and launch into a little bit of an intro for this training as we allow uh, folks to join us this afternoon. So thanks everybody so much for being here. My name is Celeste Gasparic and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Training Institute Manager with Community Nature Connection. I'm joining you all today from my home in Northeast LA, the ancestral lands of the Tongva and Quiche people. Um, I'd love to hear where everybody else is joining us from this afternoon. So I'd like to invite you to um, type your introduction into the chat box. You can go ahead and access the chat box and share with us your name, um, where you're joining from, uh, any organization you might be representing, and we encourage you to share what ancestral land you're joining from today. And if you're not sure, um, you can find it on this very cool um, native land app that I'm gonna pop into the chat. So I also wanted to make a quick um, announcement that closed captioning is available for this training. So if you'd like to see subtitles, um, you can click on the CC button at the bottom of the screen and you can select show subtitles and you'll be able to see closed captioning for today's training. So before we begin, uh, please join me in acknowledging this land, home to the Tongva, Chumash, and Tataviam peoples, original custodians of this area. We recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture, and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I wanna share with you all a little bit about Community Nature Connection. Um, before we jump into the Leave No Trace Awareness training. So CNC um, is a nonprofit organization. We are based in the Los Angeles area and our mission is to increase access to the outdoors for communities impacted by racial, socioeconomic and disability injustices by eliminating existing barriers through advocacy, community-centered programming and workforce development. And today this training is brought to you uh, through the Community Nature Connection Training Institute. And the Training Institute provides workforce development opportunities and other trainings that increase um, knowledge and skills in the naturalist, interpretive and outdoor recreation fields. So thank you so much all for being here today. Um, if you're just joining us, um, go ahead, we'd love uh, to have you introduce yourselves in the chat so you can um, say your name, where you're joining us from, what ancestral lands you're joining us from, um, and any organization that you might be representing today. A little bit of housekeeping, um, we're going to do Q&A at the end, uh, so we'll have about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A, but if you have questions that arise throughout the um, training today, you can go ahead and click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and you can enter your questions there um, and we'll save those all for the end. 
Um, and the only other reminder, if in case you missed it, um, is that closed captioning is available. So you can view subtitles for this training by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so without uh, any further delay, I am very excited to introduce our trainers. These are CNC's own Julia Soria and Bridget Arndell. So thank you so much for being here and let's get started. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bridget Arndell. Thanks for the intro, Celeste. I use she and her pronouns. I'm tuning in from East Los Angeles, which is Tongva territory. Um, and for I'm the outgoing communications and impact manager at CNC. And uh, just to give you a fun fact that's relevant to the discussion today, my favorite uh, leave no trace principle is probably number one, to plan and prepare. I'm a bit of a planner, so I like to get into the details of figuring things out and like figuring out logistics and things like that. So uh, principle number one, plan ahead and prepare is my favorite. Awesome. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, my name is Julio Soria. I use he, him pronouns. I am coming to you from my home in Whittier, which is the ancestral ceded land of the Tongva. I am the uh, stewardship and restoration program manager at CNC. And my favorite uh, principle is principle number seven, uh, I like, uh, which is um, being considerate of others. I particularly like to use this one whenever I'm asked to lead a um, a trail group at Franklin Canyon Park. We get a lot of uh, young students who come from Title I schools. And uh, you know, it, it, you can list a lot of rules with young people, but it, I just keep it simple and say, just, you know, let's just respect, let's respect the land, let's respect the wildlife and let's respect each other. And that really encompasses all of uh, the leave no trace principles all in one. Awesome. So today we're here just to uh, provide a Leave No Trace awareness course as uh, presented by the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics. Their mission is to protect the outdoors by teaching and inspiring people to enjoy it responsibly. And if I, we encourage you to visit their website at lnt.org, where they have a lot of amazing resources, including um, articles and videos, they have a lot of activities. There are LNT, uh, there is LNT curriculum uh, specifically targeted towards youth. And there's also curriculum that uh, focuses on backcountry and front country, whatever your needs are, uh, materials, and as well as uh, the whole list of all of the trainings that they offer um, that would be available to you. We also wanna incorporate a JEDI framework in today's session and encourage you to think about it moving forward as well. JEDI is an acronym for Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. It's a framework that takes a proactive approach towards addressing whole systems issues to combat inequities like racism and discrimination. As outdoor enthusiasts, we wanna be able to connect to nature when we head outside and doing so requires respecting the natural and cultural properties of a place, as well as the people while visiting, camping, and hiking in nature and beyond. So practicing or implementing leave no trace principles is not an opportunity to police people, especially historically marginalized communities. Leave no trace principles provide a framework for discussing, discussing our responsibility as humans to be stewards of the land. It's a learning opportunity and everyone deserves to feel safe and welcomed outdoors. As we go over the principles today, I'll mention different Jedi approaches that can be taken with each principle. Uh, one of my favorite Jedi approaches to being outdoors is learning about different organizations in the area that I'm visiting who focus primarily on increasing access to the outdoors for historically marginalized communities. And I encourage you to use the JEDI framework as you develop your own outdoor programs and when you're recreating outside so that we can create a more inclusive and welcoming environment for all people. We'll get into some more resources that you can utilize uh, towards the end of today's training. And so here's just an overview of the seven principles of Leave No Trace. Principle one, plan ahead and prepare. Principle two, travel and camp on durable surfaces. 
principle number three, dispose of waste properly. Principle four, leave what you find. Principle five, minimize campfire impacts. Principle six, respect wildlife. Principle seven, be considerate of others. And below are uh, a few links. Bridget, would you like to chime in on those? Yeah, so um, thinking about the JEDI framework as it applies to Leave No Trace, we've included two different um, links here to increase people's access to this information. So there's a seven principles in American Sign Language, as well as in Spanish. And those links uh, will be provided to you as well so that you can check them out. Wonderful, thank you, Bridget. And so starting with principle number one, plan ahead and prepare. Um, you know, as a individual going out on a day or like a day hike for fun, it's very important to prepare properly. It makes a difference between a good trip and a bad trip. Also as professionals, it is one of the most important things that you can do and prepare. Uh, and you know, not only preparing yourself for the day, but then also getting uh, as much uh, background information as you can about the group that you're about to serve. Um, so just in general, when you're getting ready to go out, uh, you wanna make sure you know as much as possible about possible about uh, the location that you plan to, to uh, visit. So if I'm going to the mountains, I'm checking the weather, uh, depending on the park that I'm going to, I might look at other things such as like fire conditions or wind conditions, uh, such as when I visit uh, Vasquez rocks out in the desert, you know, it can, when you're up there up on the rocks, it can get pretty windy and it's a shady situation. So I particularly, particularly look at the wind conditions when visiting that park. Likewise, when I'm going to the coast, if I want to go tide pooling, another thing I might want to do is look at tide conditions. So not only am I looking at the weather so that I am going prepared with um, all the articles of clothing and other items that I need, but I'm also checking to see um, what those tides are just so that I can enjoy the day and catch that low tide. Um, and so things that you want to do is again, like you want to check the weather, uh, and any other conditions. You also want to look at any um, rules and regulations for the particular land that you're visiting. Um, depending on the, the regulating uh, agency it will depend on uh, the type of activity activities that you can uh, partake in. And so that's really important to know uh, is, do you have to pay for parking? Uh, are there closures due to fires? Uh, can I take my dog? Sometimes no. If yes, does my dog have to be on a leash? Making sure you have that leash, right? So you wanna inform yourself as much as possible. Um, so there are uh, the, uh, the, 10, uh, the 10 items that you need the most. Oh, why am I blanking out right now? <laughs> uh, so there are like the list of top 10 items that you need uh, when going out into the woods and those can be accessed anywhere through the Leave No Trace um, website, for example. Or REI has great articles on that that we can also share with you. Uh, just having all of those important items. Um, first aid, if, first and foremost, is more important, especially for um, if you're a trail leader, you want to make sure you have um, that and any other um, equipment that is required of you, whether that be a radio, uh, an emergency, uh, you know, form to fill out in case of if something goes on. Uh, so beyond uh, checking the weather and uh, having all of the gear, uh, there's also, you know, this little thing, COVID, that we all went through, uh, but it's still kind of lingering. So different parks have different rules. So again, just make sure that you are following those rules, um, especially the summer. Um, if you're recreating, you know, there's a lot of little towns that may not be able to um, take the brunt of another outbreak. So be considerate and uh, really uh, do your homework. I traveled to Yosemite over the uh, Memorial Day weekend and they weren't allowing people into the park unless they had a uh, reservation. And so just having that information, um, you know, beforehand would help you from like ruining your trip like in case you drove all that way. Even if you were planning to drive through for the day, they were not allowing those type of folks in. Uh, so just knowing where you're going and what the regulations and requirements are, are important. Uh, on federal lands, on NPS lands, they are no longer requiring a mask, but they are requiring you to have a mask if you enter like nature centers and whatnot. Um, certainly MRCA parks, I believe they still want you to wear a mask. 
um, any of our programs until further notice. Uh, we would be having uh, folks, you know, regardless of your vaccination status, uh, just important to take care of one another. And that, Bridget, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Yeah, so a JEDI lens that can be applied to rule number one, as you're preparing and planning and working to understand the area that you're visiting, is to also look into the history of the land that you're visiting or running pro programs on. So Celeste exemplified a really great tool uh, in, in terms of how to find out who occupied or who lived on and um, thrived on that land before you visited. Um, so the Native Land app is a great way to research ahead of time and find more information about where you're going. Um, some state and national parks also offer ranger talks where you can learn about the indigenous people and the cultural history of that place. But that's not always the case. So it's really important that you do that um, homework ahead of time so that you can recognize that thriving human life existed in nature before they had English or Spanish names associated with them. Um, so just a really great tool to implement in terms of a Jedi lens for principle number one. Principle number two is traveling and camping on durable, <clears throat> excuse me, durable surfaces. So surfaces, what this means is surfaces that can handle impact. So like a compacted dirt trail, for example, rocks, stones, gravel, even wood and bridges. So pretty much um, clearly defined walking areas. Um, you also wanna stay in the center of these walking areas and trails to avoid things like poison oak or ticks as much as possible. The reason you want to stay on these designated walking paths is to protect sensitive plant and wildlife and in order to maintain the balanced ecosystem of that area. So if you're getting to enjoy the beautiful flowers and, and things of that nature, you wanna make sure that they stay there and stay protected so that folks that come, on, come in after you can also see those as well. Another important thing to consider when you're setting up camp is whenever you're near water sources, you have to keep in mind that the wildlife that live in that area depend on that water source. And if you're camping nearby and making noises and things of that nature, you're going to scare off the wildlife and uh, prevent them from wanting to get the water source that they need to survive. So keep that in mind as well. Um, most parks have designated camping areas. So it's recommended that you stay in those areas. Principle number three uh, covers disposing of waste. Uh, uh, easy little uh, saying is uh, pack it in, pack it out. And uh, certainly during uh, the last year, we saw a lot of services were temporarily discontinued in our parks and they really suffered. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, waste on the trails, um, you know, overflowing trash cans and um, even unfortunately a lot of human waste and um, tissue paper um, littering our trails. So it's really important that you know, one of the things you do as part of that preparation is knowing what kind of um, services and uh, amenities are available. Uh, and so I, you, you know, when you go to a park where there's, if you're gonna, especially if you're like leaving the front country and going more into the back country, you wanna take like a bag or of some sorts uh, to help you uh, maintain your waste. Um, if when going camping, this uh, one of the ways that I uh, practice is just beforehand by preparing. So all of the food that I take, I try to eliminate as much of that pre-packaging as possible so that I don't have to deal with that waste later. So when we take um, our youth camping, uh, we'll do a lot of that, just getting rid of all of that, um, you know, chopping up some of that food and putting it in reusable containers so that not only are you minimizing um, all of that pre-packaging, but also when you're dealing with a lot of that stuff, inevitably you're gonna create like, you know, the, the micro, uh, debris, just like, you know, little pieces that you strip off from a piece of plastic and here and there as you're opening things. And so that builds up at campsites. Um, and so those are uh, great tips that you can do to um, minimize your waste when going outdoors. Um, I also like to carry a, a bag in my, in my pack. So even though I'm mindful and I don't litter, um, just pretty much it's 100% guaranteed that I'm going to find litter on the trail. So I like to pick it up as I hike out 
And so that's something nice to do. Um, with uh, regards to human waste, there is um, a fun little rule. So just think about going number one or going number two. So if you're going number one or, or if you need to urinate, the rule is go 100 feet away from your campsite or any water source. So you take 100 steps away from, again, your, your campsite or uh, whether that be a river, lake or pond and you do your business. And typically um, it is uh, recommended that you urinate over like soil or like dried leaves. Try not to urinate on plants because um, the salts in your urine will attract wildlife and, to, and they'll you know, potentially damage the uh, sapling or whatever plant you urinated on. Um, if you have to go number two, that's you wanna walk away 200 feet away from your campsite or 200 feet away from that water source. And with that, there is um, a whole technique. There is, a, it's called a cat hole. I won't go into it too much just because of the nature of virtual. If this was in person, we would practice um, that skill. But Celeste will drop a link to a video by Leave No Trace that shows you um, beautifully how to uh, dig a cat hole. And um, they explain all the, the steps um, there. But when using a cat hole, uh, you know, it's important to like know what kind of um, paper uh, tissue you're using. So there are um, brands that are recommended that are more biodegradable. You definitely don't want to use any of the perfumed uh, paper or if, and if possible, hike it out. If you're in a desert area, it's recommended that you just pack that out. And uh, LNT also has um, a lot of different uh, techniques that they recommend. Uh, they're mainly meant for like folks who are out in the backcountry, but you know, each to their own, how you wanna um, handle packing out your waste. Finally, um, you know, for women, um, if you do have a personal uh, hygiene products, you don't want to bury those. You wanna make sure that you pack those out. Um, and if you are in the backcountry, I know they sell other products uh, for that that are more uh, sustainable to use. Uh, and uh, before we move on, uh, Bridget, is there any uh, any Jedi principles you want to? Yeah, so chat let's about? take a look at number three with the Jedi lens. So disposing of waste properly, it states that whatever you bring with you into nature, you should take out with you too, or pack out what you pack in, um, because leaving trash behind causes pollution that harms animals and the natural life cycle in the wilderness, as Julio mentioned. Um, Jedi encourages you to take this a step further and consider the greater damage that plastic waste has on our global environment in general. So yes, pack out your trash, but if it would be best if you could pack less trash to begin with. So using biodegradable bags opposed to plastic ones, for example, using reusable utensils, things of that nature. Um, uh, for women who menstruate, Diva cups are a really great option to take with you out into nature um, instead of tampons and pads. Um, the, the purpose here is to think about the connection that we have to the greater environment because we can't simply disconnect ourselves from problem plastic, for example, and it's inevitable fate of ending up in a landfill or in the ocean, which is different land, natural spaces. Um, so that's a Jedi framework to think about with principle number three. So principle number four, leave what you find. Um, I like the saying that I heard at Outward Bound Adventures, which is take only pictures and leave only footprints. Um, by leaving things where you find them, they're in nature, in the outdoors where you're at, you allow the natural ecosystem to continue its processes and remain intact for the next visitor. Um, some other things to keep in mind when you wanna minimize the damage of um, being out in nature is not carving into trees or plants or even picking flowers. I know that uh, picking flowers, it can bring nostalgia and things like that, but um, removing those flowers, if everyone did that, then there would be no flowers uh, to even see when you visit a place. So. Just remember, you can always take a picture of the flower. Um, and going back to carving into, to, into trees, it could really damage and kill trees. So it's really important that you don't carve into trees. Um, another important thing to think about 
with this one is um, minimizing the potential of bringing invasive species into a natural ecosystem where you're at. So a way to prevent that is by washing your shoes, uh, equipment, and clothing before you enter a new place. So if you have the same pair of boots that you take on hikes or on camping trips or whatever, it's recommended that you wash those before you enter a new place because it, seeds and things get caught onto laces and other areas of your equipment and clothing. Um, so to prevent bringing those, those species that don't belong in that area, please wash your things uh, ahead of time. Um, and then a Jedi lens that can be applied to this principle is leaving what you find Leaving what you find is also respecting the ancestral lands, plans, artifacts, and history of that place. Um, those things have different stories that they tell. And at a lot of different parks, um, rangers usually talk about different things in terms of the artifacts and their significance. So it's really important to preserve the ecosystem and keep that cultural significance alive. So yeah, leave what you find, take only pictures. Thank you, Bridget. I just wanted to mention the photo. Um, these are some of our youth interns in our urban archaeology uh, program. And so here, they, here uh, in partnership with the National Park Service, they are excavating at a uh, MPS site. And there was a, uh, a Chumash representative who was um, supervising the entire dig. Number five, minimize campfire impacts. This is a really interesting one uh, for all of us here in uh, Southern California. From what I gather, everyone here is uh, present, is um, in the area, either uh, here to learn about uh, it um, for recreational purposes or because we're all volunteers or uh, folks working in this um, business. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's interesting because we do live in a uh, fire country and uh, there is, um, uh, you know, for the most part, um, this isn't something that we're doing. Uh, definitely, you know, should you build a fire is like the number one question. Um, so again, by preparing uh, what, whose land are you on? I think uh, most agencies aren't allowing fires at the moment. I think uh, I looked it up. Uh, Angeles National Forest is allowing fires in um, fire pits at restricted campsites. But also, you know, a huge chunk of it is closed because of uh, the fire, the damage of the fires. Uh, same thing with the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, fires are not allowed in most parks, with the exception of, I believe it's Malibu, Malibu Creek uh, State Park. And there might be one other park where that is allowed. But again, that's pending um, the, the weather conditions and also um, the regulations of whichever uh, agency is managing the park. So you always wanna check first and foremost. Um, for us at CNC, we mainly operate on um, MR, our Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority land. And so we have permission to, uh, to put on campfire programs during our, uh, you know, for public programs or uh, our camping events, whichever that is. And we always do that in the safest manner. Um, you know, we have, we follow all of the LNT rules and also have, um, things like uh, fire extinguishers on site, on hand, and uh, buckets of water. And so I guess it comes down to, can you and should you, right? Uh, so if you are in the back country in the Angeles, it's not something that's gonna be allowed. Uh, there may not be enough uh, fuel sources. Uh, and so it's, it's more of a logistics and especially, especially here in, um, in Southern California, whether you're working in the Angeles Forest or the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, we all know uh, the risks of this. But if um, you were in other parts and let's say you wanted to practice um, some backcountry skills and uh, doing a campfire, then there are some good um, skills that you can um, practice. And so Celeste will drop a few links in the chat. One is um, how to build a mound fire to um, and the other one is a uh, how to use a uh, a fire pan, and these are uh, different methods to uh, cause the least amount of uh, disturbance and damage to the substrate as you uh, create a campfire. Then uh, 
Bridget, was there anything that you wanted to add to this? Um, not necessarily a Jedi principle, but for when you are um, going to have a campfire, it's recommended that you buy firewood from the place that you're planning to have the fire. And the reason for that is because uh, kind of what we mentioned already about invasive species, you don't wanna bring other insects from different wood um, from another place into the place you're gonna have your campfire. Um, so yeah, buy the firewood from that place that you're planning to have the fire. Very important point. Thank you, Bridget. The next one is to respect wildlife. Um, so you want to make sure that you're keeping a distance from all wildlife and uh, that's for their safety of, as well as yours. You also never want to feed animals and this is because there's many reasons you don't want to feed animals out in the wild. One is our, the food that we eat is not going to be nutritional uh, or have any nutritional value for the animals in the wild. Um, and it also creates a dependency over time. If everyone is feeding the wildlife, they create uh, a dependency on human food. And it, they also kind of drop their fear of humans, which that's not good either. They need to maintain um, those boundaries with us. Uh, so you don't wanna feed animals to protect them, keep them safe and keep them healthy as well. Um, another important thing to consider when it comes to wildlife is when you're outdoors, you want to make sure that you're storing your food and your smellables properly in a secure place away from your camp uh, and definitely not in your car, especially when you're in bear country, which is as close as our foothills. You want to store food in bear boxes only, never in your tent and never in your car. Um, bears can smell food or like can smell things up to seven miles away. So it's pretty serious that you're handling your food properly and respecting the wildlife of the place that you're visiting. Awesome. All right, finally, we have principle number seven, be considerate of others. Uh, I think this one just basically comes down to respect and you know, having a good time enjoying a good experience in, in nature. Um, and like my biggest pet peeve, I feel whether I'm working, I, I don't know when it's worse, if I'm leading a group and I'm trying to teach or if I'm just out on my own trying to enjoy nature is when somebody comes around the corner and they're just like blasting their, their, you know, their device, whatever cheap music they're listening to. Only once did I hear a song that I liked. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, people are blasting their music and it just takes away from the experience, whether you're out and you're bird watching or you're trying to learn or just, you know, experience the solitude and the tranquility of being out of nature that really does get disruptive. Uh, it, it is really disruptive. And so if you are one of these folks who loves music and, you know, you love taking your favorite tunes with you when you're on a trail, you know, do consider using um, some headphones, some earpieces um, so that you're able to enjoy your music, but not everybody else. Likewise, when you're at the campsite, you know, I get it. You're on vacation and you're having a good time, but I don't know, leave the party at, at the, leave the party in the city. You know, sometimes you get to the campsites and you can hear that one route. There's always that one rowdy group blasting their music and having a great time good for them but you know it's it's not so much fun for all the other um, neighbors at the campsite um, being considerate also means um, just general um, eti etiquette which is not only just being nice or a, a good person but it's also for safety so um, when you're out on the trail there are um, rules to go by as far as yielding so bicyclists and hikers always want to yield to the horse uh you know these animals are huge but they're interesting they're basically um prey and so they're very easy to uh, spook and so when you're um when you're on the trail and you see um someone approaching you on horseback you always want to give them the right away you want to give them the high ground and you want to just announce yourself it's like oh hello hi i'm a human uh, we do this a lot at, at Chesbro Canyon with our uh, restoration interns when we're out on the field. Uh, there's a lot of people that come through uh, on horseback. And so you just want to announce yourself, 
so that the horse knows you're there. It doesn't get spooked and it knows that you're a human and basically don't make any sudden movements or anything. Just let them pass, give them the space when possible. And then uh, mountain bikers, you got to not only yield to the horses, but you have to yield to hikers and give hikers the right of way. Uh, I know sometimes that's a, uh, could be a problem on the trail when, you know, you're enjoying it. And then all of a sudden someone's just zooming down the trail, just leaves a bunch of dust in your face. Um, it could be a, a little bit uh, annoying. Other recommendations. Uh, so uh, leave, Center for Leave No Trace, uh, they recommend not wearing bright colors because that might be um, off-putting to other hikers. I find that one a little uh, not controversial, but I used to be a uh, wilderness survival skills instructor. And we always told folks that bright colors are good because in the case that, for example, you became lost, um, you know, then a uh, search and rescue would be able to find you um, and spot you. So I, I find that one interesting, uh, looking at it from that point of view, from that lens, like search and rescue definitely wants you to be bright and stand out, right? If they're looking, if, so uh, it's, that one's a little controversial uh, for me, but they suggest that you not wear bright colors. Um, also same thing with um, your tents and all of your other equipment. Uh, finally, um, let's see, uh, as far as, um, you know, working in the outdoors, as I mentioned, um, you know, when I am out with a trail group, I always just say, just be respectful of others um, and just respect yourselves, respect the wildlife, respect this place, right? At the end of the day, we're all guests in the park. And so we have to be good guests when we visit these places. Um, and as far as COVID goes, I think one thing to consider is, uh, I know it's already kind of at the end of the game, if you will, hopefully, uh, we don't have any more uh, flare-ups and issues with that, but just consider like if you are recreating, uh, if you're traveling through small towns and consider the burden again, um, that another, you know, shutdown can place on a small town. Uh, a small town may not be able to deal with a, a large outbreak if a lot of tourists are passing through. And so uh, these are some fears that a lot of small towns, um, you know, have gone through and are still going through, especially as a, summer travel season is um is happening and so just be considerate be mindful of how many stops you have to make um how many uh refueling uh you know uh situations how spots you have to do um so just be mindful of all of that and that is um just some general tips on how uh, we can be considerate There are a few things to consider as it relates to Jedi and principle number seven. Um, so again, kind of want to remind you of the purpose of Leave No Trace is to make folks feel more welcomed outside and um, that we create stewards at the end of the day. We want to encourage folks to want to protect the, these natural spaces that we are going into. And in order for them to want to protect it, they also want to need to feel that sense of belonging or, you know, in that space. And so I think principle number seven really encompasses how we can achieve that is by being more considerate of others, being more inclusive of others outdoors. Um, and so a few things that we can apply here, um, we have modeled it here for you today by using, um, expressing the, the pronouns that we like to use. Um, that's one way that you can be more inclusive of folks. Another important factor to consider is the notion of increasing access to the outdoors by ensuring that Black, Indigenous, and people of color feel welcomed and safe being outside in nature. This is really important to state because statistically these communities are accessing the benefits of nature far less often due to safety reasons. Um, and I just want to state that nature is here for all of us to enjoy in our own ways and as our responsibility as Leave No Trace advocates to ensure that all of us feel welcomed and connected to these great wonders of our planet. So that's awesome. that. I want well to said. <laughs> Thanks. I want to close with a call to action for everyone here today, um, encouraging you to think about how you can apply these seven principles to your next outdoor adventure. Um, how you can incorporate the Jedi principles um, in these outdoor adventures or whenever you're outdoors. 
um, especially acknowledging the native land that you're visiting and researching access orgs that you could potentially partner with uh, for programming in the future. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julio and Bridget. Um, we have time now for questions. So I would definitely encourage everybody to let us know if you have any questions um, via the chat or the Q&A box, or if you want to speak. I know we have an intimate group today, so you can, um, I think you can raise your hand um, and I can give you access to the microphone and let you ask your question live. Um, so yeah, fire away, um, either in the chat box or Q&A box or um, raise your hand and I can uh, allow you to speak. I'll give folks a little bit of time to type any questions they may have um, or to request access to the microphone. And in the meantime, um, I'll just say, I want to thank everybody so much for being here. I want to thank Julio and Bridget um, for taking the time to share with us about Leave No Trace and the seven principles and for putting it, um, for making Jedi a big part of discussing the principles. Um, and as far as the training institute, if you guys enjoyed some of the Jedi related content uh, during this training today, we have another training coming up next month. Um, it is on July 21st and it's called Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Getting to the Root. And that's gonna dive um, a lot deeper into the Jedi framework um, and talk about systems of equity and a lot of good stuff. Um, and there's a great trainer that I know Julio can attest to. Um, and some of that training um, material will be through the context of climate justice. Um, so definitely uh, I'll pop the registration link in the chat right now. Um, and so, yeah, we got a couple questions coming in. Um, Somebody just asked Jedi about the acronym. It's uh, it stands for Justice, Equity, Diversi Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, and so we did um, try to present the seven principles today um, in the context of that Jedi lens. Um, so yeah, thanks for clarifying the acronym usage. And uh, then we have another question coming in from Michael Garcia. Um, he's asking, uh, is a California campfire permit required even for using stoves? That's a great question. So, uh, depending on what park you want to go at, uh, you want to visit, you want to check on that, uh, their website. So for example, I know MRCA does not allow um, stoves on their parklands. Uh, and I, I cannot speak for uh, National Park Service or California State Parks. So you do wanna visit the, uh, the site of the, the agency that manages the land that you're visiting and uh, look that up. Awesome, thanks Julio. And thanks for your question, Michael. Um, let's see, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in right now, um, but definitely we're here for a few more minutes if you would like to ask um, any more questions. And then if not, if they come to you later, um, Bridget and Julio have shared their email addresses uh, here on the final slide. So um, I can send those around in an email to all participants after this training. We'll also have a recording of the training if you ever wanted to go back and reference anything. Um, and I'll, I'll also send some of those links that I um, dropped into the chat during the presentation today, just so you guys have all those resources and you can kind of uh, dig into the to more information um, on your own time after the training. So with that, um, I think we'll wrap it 
up as I don't see any other questions. And I wanna thank everybody um, so much for attending today. And thank you so much to Julio and Bridget for giving us this awesome um, training on Leave No Trace. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's see, I have one question coming in. So yeah, you know, feel free to stay or feel free to go, everybody. Um, we're gonna take this question from Reina. Hi, um, thank you, this has been awesome. I just wondered what is the best Jedi way to enforce or train your campers on the rules of the land and everything. And if they're breaking a rule, you know, it's the, to not make them feel bad, you know. Um, I could attempt this answer. Um... I mean, based on what we've been taught with Leave No Trace, it's you want to come to them uh, with like a specific tone, like you don't want to sound condescending or argumentative or um, combative or anything like that. You want to use it as a teaching moment. It really helps to provide the reasons these rules are in place. So, um, for example, with the um, stay on durable surfaces knowing you staying on the trail prevents the destruction of plants helps you to remember why that's important. So really providing that context and that information behind why the rules are, are there is a really great tool to utilize. Um, there was also a reference of like, when you're talking to somebody about these principles, talking to them like side to side opposed to face to face, um, it's less confrontational. Um, but there is a link that we could probably share and drop in the chat. I can look for it um, from the Leave No Trace network about how you can specifically approach someone who is breaking a rule in a way that's not disrespectful. Yeah, that was a, a great question, Rena. Um, it, it, so it comes down to like authority of the resource. Uh, for me, like the way this comes up the most is usually not with groups, but other people in the park, you know. Um, just practicing bad behaviors, uh, particularly dog walkers. Um, they always have like their dog um, off leash. Um, that's a, a big issue that I see in all of our parks and all of our parks um, do have uh, the rule of having your dog on leash. And so the way I approach it more about like, hey, like, you know, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. The rule is keep your dog on a leash. It's more of like, kind of educate them as to why it's important, uh, you know, the, the dog off leash does um, interfere with like nesting birds and other burrowing animals. But sometimes you just have to um, appeal to their, you know, their own self-interest. So I usually like to like give the example, like you're, if your dog is running into the brush, you know, there's, they're probably brushing up on the poison oak and then they're gonna be transferring those oils, um, you know, potentially back home. And that's something that can be bad for your dog and bad for yourself, which is true. Right, and so sometimes maybe you want to like use some of those educational um, kind of tactics, if you will, to kind of get folks to uh, to follow the rules. And, and again, the rules are always um, you know to protect people and and the place. Yeah, that sounds great. But what if it's an emergency? The dog is charging <laughs> at somebody, you know, including yourself, and uh, you have to really act quickly and say the right thing and do the right thing. Yes, that's a different situation and obviously get yourself and your group to safety and then contact a park ranger and let them handle that. That's mm -hmm. definitely not, wouldn't be your responsibility or like my responsibility as a trail leader at that point. Right. So you'd really have to know your coordinates where you are, <laughs> be able to tell that to them, the ranger so they can come out, out there. Well, it's it's an amazing thing. Thank you, thank you again. And just a heads up, Celeste dropped the link there on how to respond. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your question, Rena. Definitely, um, definitely open that link. It's a whole blog from the Leave No Trace Center about using the authority of the resource and the educational approach. I'm not um, sure how I how I copy this 
Um, oh, well, you don't worry. I can send all the links over in a follow-up email too. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, anybody else have any questions? All right, well, with that, I think we will call it a day, wrapping up a uh, couple minutes early here. Definitely encourage you all to check the follow-up email for those links, um, for the reading, digger, deeping, digger, wait, sorry, I can't talk, digging deeper into some of the great content um, that we have sort of, um, you know, gotten we've we've really only gotten to like the tip of it today so there's just so much more um to check out oh i'm sorry i'm getting um a little chat that we do have a couple more questions in the q a so thank you for bringing those to my attention um so let's see any more links resources for beginner campers on how to stay safe um Let's see, Julio or Bridget, do you want to take that? Best resources for beginning campers and especially about safety? Yeah, I think uh, the Leave No Trace website is a, a great first place um, for stop to check out. Um, and, you know, definitely following principle number one and doing all the research. The more you're prepared, the more you're going to have not only a safe experience, but a, a fun experience. And so it's really when you go into a situation unprepared that you, you get into some um, sketchy situations, right? So again, if you're visiting a site and you're not familiar with the terrain or you're, you didn't know that there was um, you know, a fire closure or services are discontinued, um, then you're potentially setting yourself up for a, a bad situation. Likewise, if you're doing a backcountry hike and you don't, you didn't like fully like study the map and map out your trail, uh, you know the potential for getting lost is there. So really, uh, it, it it boils down to principle number one. So there's a lot of um, sites, and I could uh, share this. I'll share this with Celeste. She could share it. There's a lot of different um, bloggers and uh, different um, folks who just like to uh, talk, like you know type up their experiences on trails and that's a great way that's what i uh like to utilize when i check out a new trail and then um, there's maps obviously the sites of all the uh the park agencies and utilize the park rangers and kiosks so uh, you know it, i'm talking about all of these virtual resources because i've been used to covid for like the past year now but the best resources are at the park uh, go to the kiosk check out what's on the kiosk and go to the nature center the rangers are back in the nature centers talk to the people they can give you all the tips and all the you know give you all of the the information on what what you need to know and recommendations on where to go that's my advice bridget you good awesome yeah i i mean even if you can't if you're going camping and you can't kind of like make a visit before you go camp or something, give them a call over there. You always get the, the best advice, like Julio said, from somebody that works um, at the park or the area that you're gonna go visit. And they, they know how you can stay safe too. They know what you should look out for. So talk to somebody um, that works there. That's really what they're there for. So awesome. Thanks for that question. That's a really good one. Um, and then a couple other questions from, is it Goyo in the chat uh, or in the Q&A box about when we'll be giving live tours again or live hikes? And um, are you referring, is, it, is this a volunteer or are, you, or are you talking about Community Nature Connection or do you want to provide a little clarification? Yes, Franklin Canyon. Awesome, thank you. Um, great question. Um, I think Kelly is gonna be your best contact for that. And we are having conversations about returning to in-person programming. I'm not sure if like a date has been put on the calendar, but definitely check in with Kelly about that and hopefully really soon. 
Cool. Okay. Well, I've already done my closing like twice, um, so I won't <laughs> do it again. <laughs> um, but I really, really thank you guys so much for being here, and thanks to Julio and to Bridget. Um, and I hope everybody has a lovely afternoon. Thanks again. Bye, everybody.